we have a new free book for Human Action Podcast listeners, Dr. Guido Holzman's How Inflation Destroys Civilization. Learn how inflation isn't only making us poorer, it's harming our culture, mental well-being, and the moral foundations of civilization itself. Get your free copy today at mises.org slash HAPod free. This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, Bob Murphy here. Just wanted to explain this particular episode of the Human Action Podcast is going to be a rebroadcast of a talk that I gave at Oklahoma State earlier this week. So the talk specifically occurred on March 26th. And the title is Beyond the State, Law and Order Through Voluntary Exchange. So I was there at Oklahoma State to give a series of lectures over the course of two days, and we thought it would make sense to go ahead and rebroadcast this. So if you've been watching Mises University over the years, a lot of this material you're going to hear from me in this episode is going to be redundant, but this particular talk, it's not a carbon copy of other talks I've given. So I grabbed from different sources. So this is going to be new in that sense. Also, last uh, bit of housekeeping, if you're able to watch the video version of this as opposed to just listening to the audio, there is a PowerPoint that uh, Clay on our end here did a good job of interspersing into the video. So uh, it'll make more sense if you watch the video on this particular episode. So without further ado, here we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Um, is this amplifying me? Are you, okay, great. Um, so let me just start with some disclaimers. So I, there's a, a mixture in here that I know some people came up before I started and said, oh yeah, I've read your stuff, I watched your lecture, so they know exactly the kind of thing I'm gonna talk about. Others here, I know you're here because you're getting extra credit. That's fine, I'm an economist, I understand how the world works. But so I know if, if you haven't heard some of this stuff before, uh, it, it's going to sound off the wall. It's going to sound crazy, right? It's, it's way out of the ordinary mainstream discussion. Given that right now, I'm just going to go for about an hour and then leave time at the end for your questions. So I have a lot of material to cover. So I'm going to rush through and I might say certain things that, you know, you might say, wow, that, that's kind of a bold claim. Maybe we should unpack that a bit, but I'm just going to have to move on to the next one, okay? So I just want to say at the outset, I realize if, you're, if you haven't heard this type of discussion or this analysis before, it is going to seem like fanciful and so forth. Yes. And we have an hour and 15 minutes tomorrow. Over here. Yeah, right. Yes. So there's going to be further discussion tomorrow as well. So by all means, if you know, if you have questions, if you're doubtful, I'm, I'm very happy at the end of this or, you know, after the talk or tomorrow at the lunch discussion to flesh some of the stuff out. If you want to see more. So, you know, my name, Robert Murphy, you just Google and type in some of the things. There's plenty of stuff that I've written both for the layperson and like, you know, published journal articles and economics journals and also lots of lectures with a lot of this stuff. You know, I might have done a whole lecture on just one of these sub points kind of thing. But here I was trying to put it all together and just go through a crash course just so you could hear this perspective. If if you don't already think like this, I'm not expecting after listening to 60 minutes of it, you're going to all of a sudden have an epiphany and realize, ah, yes, we don't need a state anymore. But I just want to show you that it's philosophically possible that the you know the institution of the state so that's that's what the talk tonight is about is to show that um it, is it actually necessary for law and order right so we're going to basically be talking about how could you have a legal system how could you have analogs in a, in a voluntary private market setting of what we currently think of as the job that the police do or the courts do and then even the military so again, that's a lot of material to cover. Clearly, like I say, it's in 60 minutes, I'm not gonna be able to make the definitive case for it, but I just wanna give you a taste of what an argument along these lines would look like. And then if you wanna read more, like I said, there's a whole literature on this stuff. Okay, just, as a, just to avoid confusion in case some of you are familiar with you know, some of my other writings, I have written a lot over the years about um, pacifism, particularly coming out of a Christian perspective. So he, the stuff I'm talking about tonight is just my analysis as an economy. So for it, an analogy, I could get up here and talk about drug legalization and say, you know, I don't think it's a good thing for society to put, you know, heroin dealers in jail for 30 years. 
I think it's counterproductive and it you know, doesn't actually reduce use or it makes it more potent and, da, 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 and overdose it. But I'm going to I don't use heroin myself and I'm going to raise my children not to use it. Right. So I certainly don't think if you become an addict that you're doing something good with your life. So but you see how those are two different things. So likewise, tonight I'm going to be talking, especially later, about, you know, military defense and things like that. So I'm not saying if I were an individual living in a free society that I necessarily would be personally patronizing certain companies that use large scale weaponry to achieve social ends. But I'm just predicting as an economist, this is what I think, for example, the current region of the United States, how it would unfold if everybody decided, hey, let's where possible try to engage in activities through a voluntary fashion. So let me just emphasize that just so you understand, like, what is it that we're, we're trying to talk about? What does it mean to say beyond the state using voluntary mechanisms to achieve these outcomes? What I mean is right now, you know, how does, quote, the government work? Well, there's different ways of defining it, but two of the essential attributes to, of what we mean by the state in a modern political context are that it claims the right to en enact taxation and it claims the right within a certain jurisdiction that it is the sole agency or institution that can determine the lawful use of violence. Okay, so there's different definitions floating around, but a lot of economists focus on those are two key elements, that if it didn't have those two things, it wouldn't be a state, it would be something else. Okay, and so as far as taxation, now there's a sense in which it's voluntary, like, oh yeah, we have periodic elections and so on, but any individual, if you don't pay your taxes and the government, you know, if it's a big enough deal and the government might send you letters at first, your employer might do so, but ultimately guys with guns will show up and throw you in a cage. And that's why most people pay taxes even if they don't really agree with what the government's doing with their money, at least not, you know, on every little um, dollar and cents down to the, every budget item. Whereas, you know, so, so there's a huge chasm between that way of solving social problems versus the market setting. The people can complain about certain businesses and, oh yeah, I don't like the, you know, the McDonald's food isn't great for you, or I don't like the practices of this company or what. But ultimately, if you don't like what a private business is doing, you don't have to give them your money. Okay, you do have that choice. Whereas with the state, vis-a-vis -vis any individual, the, the situation is much different. You, you don't have the right to just not do that, to opt out, to say, I don't want to participate in this system. They're going to say too bad. And so as far as, you know, why is that? Most people, the, the sort of reflexive answer they would give is to say, well, there's certain things like, you know, having the roads, but particularly law and order, you know, having jails, having a court system and having a military that's gonna protect us from foreign invaders, where it just seems that method that we use for Walmart and McDonald's just wouldn't work in that setting. And so that's why we need a different approach. And I think that's what most people think, you know, besides, you know, whatever Hobbes or whoever could have written in terms of political science, but in terms of the everyday practical affairs, I think most people have this idea that, yes, the private voluntary setting is good for making apples and computers and cars, but not for determining who a serial killer is and what should be done with that person and not for defending us from China invading us. And so that's what I'm tackling tonight is I want to show you that actually a lot of economists and political philosophers have pushed the bounds of that uh, way of thinking to show, like, let's not rush to conclusions here. Maybe actually you could use a voluntary market setting approach to provide a lot of the services that we just sort of habitually think, oh, of course that has to be provided by the state. Okay, so conceptually, even though uh, for a lot of people, if I said, hey, do you think a group of people could have a truly voluntary society where there's no institutionalized coercion? Maybe that's one way of putting it, right? In any group of individuals, any society, there's gonna be involuntary things that happen, right? Some people are gonna to try to steal, some people are gonna engage in you know, murder and rape and other you know, antisocial involuntary activities. But the essence of living in a society where there's a state or what we colloquially call the government, there's an institution that by its very essence is involuntary in the sense I just said a couple of minutes ago. And so th what I'm trying to instead sketch a vision of is to say, could you have a society that is basically voluntary, where there's no institutionalized theft, for example, which is what a lot of people you know, consider taxation to be. Right? There's, there's memes floating around saying taxation is theft. And again, that's the, the, the essential criticism of it, 
is to say it is involuntary in a way that when you pay money to a corporation or, you know, just a small mom and pop business, that that's, there's a fundamental difference there. Okay, so could there be an organization or could there be a society without this institutionalized theft, for example? Okay, so when someone brings that up as a possibility, I think a lot of people, the go-to objection is military defense. That's the hardest problem to tackle. But actually, conceptually, I think it's that's not a big deal. So that's why I'm going to first walk you through private law. That, that, that I think, is, is more difficult conceptually. And then once we understand, at least, you know, you can understand the argument, whether or not it convince you that, oh, yeah, we can imagine a society where there's no systematic institutionalized coercion, and yet there's a rule of law, and it makes sense to speak of judges and laws being enforced and so forth, and there's property titles, if you can, if I can sketch a way that that could even be theoretically possible, again, in a voluntary setting without some central agency that's in charge of everything, then I think to say, okay, well then what would they do to defend themselves from foreign invaders is actually more just like of a technological problem. It's not really a conceptual one, right? So I think this is really the essence of what the advocate of what we're going to call a free society has to really tackle is this part. Okay, so just to kind of warm us up here, let me, you know, because I've, I've been giving talks like this and arguing with people online about this stuff for decades at this point. And so I know there's a lot of like immediate objections that come up. And I just want to show you in other settings, those type of immediate knee jerk reactions would actually be silly. Okay, so when you say to somebody, hey, can you imagine a society where there's private law? Where, the, where, you know, there's not one group or one organization whose function it is to tell everybody else this is what the law is, right? Because that's kind of like what Congress does. There's a Supreme Court and stuff like that. But you get the idea that we say, oh, in our society, you know, there's a federalist system. And at the top, there's the federal government. And then the Congress says what, you know, the, they pass legislation. And then the executive enacts it and so forth. And, da, 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 and that's where the laws come from. Okay, so to say, well, what if you didn't have a central organization like that? What if instead there was no one group that was in charge and everything was sort of voluntary? Could that system produce something that we might call the rule of law? And some, you know, I think one obvious immediate response is, well, no, that's impossible. You need to have one group in charge. And so I want to say, well, that's not true in science, right? There's no one group on planet Earth that's in charge of physics, that tells everybody else, this is what the laws of nature are, right? So, it, so clearly, again, I'm just, I'm just using analogies just to try to refine your thinking. We all, but, but it, physics isn't arbitrary, right? There's definitely a fact of the matter, or even, you know, we could say, we, we don't know for sure, like what's the law of gravity? We thought we knew what it was in the year 1840. And then Einstein comes along and overturns our understanding of it and so on. But you can see that there's definitely an orderliness to that. And it's not because Einstein was stronger or had more guns at his disposal. You know, he appealed to experimental evidence and so forth. All right. So there's clearly an orderliness in science, even though there's no one group in charge of it. And in fact, in some countries, they did have versions of having a group in charge like over the Soviet Union they did, especially like in biology and, and uh, agriculture and whatnot, there was a lot of political interference in the scientific undertakings, and that wasn't conducive to good science, right? That science flourishes in what we would call free open societies where everybody's free to come up with a bold conjecture, and then you go and see if it, if it pans out. Okay, so again, just we're just warming up here, trying to show clearly this notion that you need to have one group in charge isn't true in something like science. And that's, you know, and science is important too. That's not some arbitrary thing. It's not like music or something that you could say, well, what's the big deal? One way or the other, people like certain kind of music. No one's in charge of music, who cares? No, science is essential and yet nobody's in charge of it and yet it's very orderly. Okay, so now you might come back and say, okay, fine, but science is different from like law because, you know, science is objective. It's, it's out there. It's the laws of nature is basically what we're trying to, codify with the you know physics textbooks and it is what it is and so like you said with your example murphy about einstein coming along and overturning the newtonian theory of gravity it's 
it's be, it's not because of his rhetoric or because he won an election, sure, but that's because gravity is what it is. And general relativity explained, you know, there were certain things like the wobble in Mercury's orbit and things like that, that Einstein's theory had more predictive success than the old Newtonian system. And that's why over time, more and more physicists said, yep, this looks like it's a better theory. And that's why they embraced that one. And, you, and then so you could say, but that, that, that's not how it is with law. And it's because that's more subjective. Humans create the law. Okay, that's true, but humans also create spoken language, right? And so even there, though, there is a, um, an orderliness in it, okay? There's no one group in charge of the English language. And yet there can be a fact of the matter, right? There's dictionaries. And so imagine, so, so you might say, Okay, well, isn't it the publishers of the dictionaries? Don't they kind of determine the definitions of words? And I would say not really. It's more accurate to say they codify what the prevailing agreement is among English speakers about what these words mean. And the way to see that is suppose Webster's or Oxford comes out with a new dictionary next year, you know, the new edition. And if you look up under the, the entry for up, you know, UP, it says moving towards the floor. And that's what it says in all the, you know, it's not a typo. Like that, that's what they say it is. People would say, no, that, that's wrong. They, they wouldn't say, oh, I used to think up meant going this way. Turns out I was mistaken. No, they would just say Oxford or Webster's published the wrong definition because that's, that's incorrect. So again, I realize these are like simplistic observations here, but I'm just trying to get, get you to see some of the mental framing about why we need the state to produce the laws, a lot of the, if you, you know, just if I asked you 10 minutes ago to explain why you think that might be, a lot of the stuff you might say as justification would be disproven with some of these examples. So I'm just trying to get you to see that, no, it's the answer has got to be more nuanced than that. So again, there's nobody, just to re reiterate the point, nobody's in charge of the English language, and yet there is a fact of the matter, right? And it even gets more nuanced if you think it through. If you go read stuff from Shakespeare's time, it's clearly English, right? It's not that you're looking at that and you, ha you can't make heads or tails of it. It's English, but yet the usage and the, the spelling is a little different, right? The way they talk back then is a little different. So the English language itself changes over time. You know, the rules of English morph over time slowly, but at any given moment, there's a fact of the matter, right? If you write a paper for your English class, the, the teacher can come back and, and mark it up and say, this is ungrammatical. No, and there's things like style guides that you can consult. And also, to, again, you can push this analogy pretty far between law and language, you know, spoken natural languages, because for some things, it's, there's like knife edge cases where it's a bit controversial. You know, certain things about like, do you use who or whom? It's a little bit, you know, gets out there. And then there's other examples of things where even some grammar experts might have a difference of opinion. You know, if it's some case that's a little bit, it's, it's unclear. Whereas to say, you know, I done gone to the store yesterday, everyone knows that's ungrammatical. That, that, that's, that's not how English should be spoken properly. Whereas again, there's other sentence, like can you end a, pre a sentence with a preposition? You know, a lot of people will say, no, don't do that. But some will say, yeah, actually, no, there, there shouldn't be a rule against that, right? So there's things that are a little bit vaguer. So you, you understand the point I'm making. And so there, that is exactly what's true in a legal system. There's certain things. If some family's eaten in a park in broad daylight, you just walk up with a gun and shoot the guy in the head. That's illegal. That's murder. You can't do that. But what if somebody comes up to me and they're trying to take my wallet from me, but, and they don't, they're not armed. And I take out a gun and shoot him in the head. Is that illegal? What I just did. And now some legal experts might say, yes, that was excessive force. Others would say, no, that's self-defense. You see what I'm saying? So that's what I'm trying to get you to see is what is true in spoken language. That's a very good analogy to use to start thinking through what would it mean to say, could there be a legal system, even if there's no one group in charge of it? Um, another element, too, just to, to go along with this, to think through, is when it comes to uh, you know, common conventional units and things like that that are in a sense arbitrary where humans just need a, a focal point, a reference point, 
okay? Because again, that might be a difference you might say between language and law. Is there certain things like in the law, which side of the street do people drive on? In the grand scheme, it doesn't really matter, but it's got to be one or the other. It can't just be left up to, you know, the driver's choice. But whether it's the right side or the left side is kind of arbitrary. So again, th there's no reason to suppose that you need some central organization to do that. We've got centralized, or sorry, we've got systematic uniformity in science with weights and measures. And yet again, it's not that there's some agency that's going to punish you if you walk around saying you think that, you know, a meter is 200 centimeters long. You're not going to get in trouble. It's just you're, you're not going to do well if that's the way you're walking around talking like that and trying to operate like that. Okay. So again, a lot of these things, we, we sort of take it for granted that common standards that are in a sense arbitrary, but we need to have a unit that we all agree on that happens, you know, spontaneously would be the word we use in lots of these other contexts. And we don't bat an eye thinking about it. So let's, again, the point being, let's not just be so quick to say when it comes to property titles and to determine if somebody uses violence in this certain setting, is that illegal or not? Or if it is illegal, what should the punishment be to assume that, well, gee, for a question like that, the only possible answer is every four years we have to elect a president who's the person in charge of this whole region. Like, no, why would you think that has to be the case? That doesn't have to be the case to determine what a kilogram is. Okay. So let me just start uh, speeding up here, going through some of this material. Again, uh, I got about 40 minutes left at this point. I want to get through private law, private defense, and then leave time at the end for your questions. So I think the, the essential element of what uh, a voluntary private legal system is built on is the fact that when two people have a dispute, what are they, and they can't work it out, they go seek the services of some disinterested third party. In our setting today, and so this isn't science fiction. Right now we have this system, we call it arbitration, all right? And so if you, I know if, you know, you're, you're not out in the, in the corporate, you know, working nine to five kind of world yet, maybe this isn't as real to you, but in the business world, there's lots of times where like a company might have a disagreement either with another company or with an employee, and yes, they could go to the government court system, but it's real backlog. You know, it's like, oh, geez, we wouldn't even get a court date for 12 months. We need to settle this now. And so what do they do? They both agree we will submit our dispute to private binding resol uh, dispute resolution or, or uh, arbitration. And so it's like ahead of time, they're both agreeing we forfeit our right to take this to the government court, you know, which is our right legally in this land we live in according to the jurisdiction and the statutes of the legislature. And we, we both kind of opt out of that. We agree we're just going to submit it to this third party. And the reason for doing that is because, again, you, you want to resolve the dispute. So in the overwhelming majority of cases, when people have a legitimate disagreement, they both sincerely believe they're in the right. And so they're willing to go to before a third party because they think, no, if I just explain my case to somebody, he's going to agree with me because I'm right and this guy's being a jerk. And the other person thinks that too. You know, people are very, naturally are very um, biased and think that they're in the right. Okay, most people go to sleep at night thinking they're basically a good person. And yet they all disagree with each other all the time. So they can't all be right. And yet that's, that's how things work. Okay, humans are very good at backfilling and coming up with narratives in which, you know, you're the hero of the story and everybody else is out to get you or is, is a jerk. Okay. So given that then, I'm saying what ends up happening is when there's these disputes, there is a market for legal services, for opinions. And how would those sorts of judges, we call, let's call them judges, you know, so in our society now, we would call them arbitrators because we would tend to reserve the term judge, you know, for the government appointed official person, but in this voluntary setting, what we would call arbitrators today, you know, might end up being called judges, especially like if they're prestigious enough and so forth. How do they stay in business? They have a reputation for fairness, for judiciousness, right? If they were a female unmarried, she could be the fairest maiden in the land. That could be her catchphrase in terms of like how to get business. So for example, if, if two people are getting divorced right now, they might go to arbitration. And so it can't be the case that that arbitrator has a reputation that, oh yeah, the husband's always right or 
the wife is always right because then the other party wouldn't agree to that person. All right, so there can be people, and, and so this is part of it, like until you've seen it with your own eyes, you might just think this is impossible that, you know, the, the people, the, like again, let's just say it's a divorce. The, the husband would always want to go to an arbitrator who's pro-husband and the wife would always want to go to an arbitrator who's pro-wife and so therefore this can't work. But that's not true, empirically. We can just look around and see, no, people go to private arbitration to come up with divorce settlements all the time. Wh why? Because it's cheaper and faster. And it's fair. You have some say in the matter. Whereas if you go to the government system, typically you're just assigned a judge. And it might be the case that both parties would rather go to somebody else. Like the, the private arbitrator can say ahead of time, this is the, this, the code that I will use. These are the criteria I will use in rendering an opinion on this case. And then the people who have disputes can decide, do we want to use this code you know, as, as the rule book to govern our dispute, right? So if you're, if you're an Orthodox Jew and you're in a dispute with another Orthodox Jew, you might go to some reputable rabbi who says, I'm going to use, you know, the tenets of our faith in order to decide this matter. Whereas if you were a secular person, you obviously wouldn't go to that rabbi, you'd go to somebody else, right? But the point being, people who are in disputes with each other have a whole range, a whole buffet of possible arbitrators to choose from in a voluntary setting. Whereas under the state version, you're just assigned somebody, maybe the guy who won an election recently, and that's why he's the judge in this area, and he might not have any expertise in that area, or it might be most people who get assigned to that judge and he renders opinions in their cases, if you ask them, they would be very unhappy and say, yeah, we, my lawyer brought up X, Y, and Z, and the judge didn't even consider that stuff. The guy's terrible. And yet, how does he stay in business because he has a monopoly, at least in a certain you know, jurisdiction? The government guarantees him clients, whereas in a private voluntary setting, if you want to be a mediator in today's world or in the kind of society I'm talking about, if you want to be a judge, you only stay in business if you have a reputation for fairness and competence. Okay, so essentially what is it? It's not that this judge in this setting you know, has some power over you. All he or she is really doing is rendering an opinion. And that's even noticed, even in today's framework, that's what the judge, even the Supreme Court, what do they do? They write an opinion. And then if it's the majority, then, you know, that's what wins the day in terms of the settles the case, you know, so-and-so wrote the majority opinion. But notice that we use that term opinion. So even here, we have the vestiges that, you know, goes back to the British common law system, where the idea is the law is this thing that's out there. And then what the judge does is take the facts of the case and applies the law to that particular case, the facts there, and says, in my opinion, this is how the law, you know, the relevant law applies here. And, and the reason it's, it's not obvious and you do need a judge, right? You can, it's not just a simple algorithm that you could have a computer do. It does require a judge because there can be competing, even contradictory things in the law. Just like I said, even, even in terms of grammar, you know, there might be one rule that says you should do this, but another rule of thumb that says, oh, do this in your writing. And then what if you come up with this weird situation where the sentence you wanted to write, the one rule says do it this way and the other rule says, and then that's why you might not be sure. And so that's why you might, you know, go to an expert or someone who writes style guides and whatnot. And just the fact that you grew up speaking that as your native tongue might not be enough for you to know what's the grammatical thing here. So likewise with the law, yeah, there's obvious cases. You walk up to somebody in the park in broad daylight and shoot them in the head. That's illegal. You can't do that. But someone breaks into your house and then, well, but it's a, it's a 12 year old kid, you know, and they were playing baseball and the baseball broke your window and he didn't, and it wasn't obvious. He rang your bell a few times and you were sleeping. And then he kind of, you know, crawled through the window and you, he was getting his baseball and then you shot him. Is that legal? Well, it's not as obviously wrong as shooting somebody in the park in broad daylight, but this is not the same thing as somebody, you know, a 25 year old with a ski mask on at 2 a.m. breaking in, uh, you know, with a bag over his shoulder and has all your diamonds in it, right? So you can see how even here, you can't just write simple sentences to say this is what the law is and there's no ambiguity that no, human society is complex and messy and you need judges to render opinions in certain cases. Okay, so that's, so the judge renders an opinion and you might say, well, you know, what's the, the point of that? So yes, on the one hand, people ahead of time might agree 
we're going to submit to this. And even there, I don't have time to get in. I don't want to get bogged down, but you can bring up stuff like appeals, right? Like what if, yes, ahead of time you did say, uh, you know, I, I'm in a dispute with my employer. The contract in my mind clearly said that he was going to pay me overtime if I come in on Saturday. Well, I came in on Saturday last month, three times, and he's not paying me overtime. But then the employer says, yeah, but you also missed, you know, cause you had to take your kid to soccer practice. And so you missed the other days, you know, the normal week, work week. And so I was thinking you were just making up for it. So I don't think I should pay you. You know, there's things like that. And maybe that wasn't spelled out in the contract. And so you agree ahead of time and you go to some private arbitrator who's got a reputation for employer employee labor disputes. And it's very fair. And the guy, you know, you, you come up there and he says, okay, here's how we're going to settle this dispute. You know, the, you, your lawyer presents and, and why would you need lawyers in this system the same way you need now? Just someone who is your advocate that's familiar with your situation and knows the law so can very succinctly present your case to the judge in a very compelling, efficient manner, like to make it more likely that the judge is going to see, oh, yeah, the law does come down in your favor because your lawyer helped me see that, you know, it's the law is a big voluminous thing. There's lots of precedent in case law. So lawyers help. That's their function. And so maybe you go ahead and, you know, the one guy presents his case and the employer presents their case, and the judge says, okay, here's how we're going to decide, decide this. Here's a dartboard. Here you go. Here you go. Go ahead. Whoever gets closest to the bullseye wins. That would be kind of nutty, right? And so even if you did sign something ahead of time saying we agree to submit to this arbitrator because in the past he has shown a, you know, a very competent, uh, fair way of approaching labor disputes, if in your particular case he did something off the wall, like, you know, maybe he just went nuts, then you could appeal that. And what would that mean? It's not, again, that there has to be some hierarchical thing and that a group of legislatures passed something 300 years ago spelled out in this thing that we call the Constitution. No, it could just be you could appeal to the community and say, that's nuts. Go to some other judge and say, you know, I want to appeal my case to you. Look at what happened. And then that judge could agree to hear the case or not and then would overturn if he, if he or she thought, oh, yeah, that, that last ruling was nutty. I'm willing to see, right? So, so the judge's reputations would be based on that too, that it would, be, it would be risky for them to make a ruling that was very far outside of the line of what precedent said for cases like that because then another judge might render a different opinion and say, I think that was wrong, okay? So and just like with science and other things and, well, what if one grammar expert says this and another says, how do we know? Again, we have a way of assessing competence and excellence. And there's like a hierarchy of professionalism. I'll put it to you this way, that there's probably not too much disagreement about whether a certain mathematician is in the top 1000 mathematicians alive. And who would know that? All the mathematicians, right? You, most, if, unless you're a, you know, a math professor in here, you, you probably wouldn't know. I, I wouldn't be competent to judge that. But PhDs in math, would be able to tell whether if we just grab somebody and said, this person right here, right now, do you think he's in the top 1,000 of living mathematicians? There would probably be a lot of uh, consensus on that. Okay, so likewise, among the practicing judges, if one judge came forward and said, yeah, that last ruling was nutty, I'm going to go ahead and rule and overturn that, the existing legal community, if that original ruling really was nutty, then you know, they might agree to that. Okay, so there would be some consensus. And so that's why there would be orderliness. Okay, so the employer, for example, if they lost the dispute against the employee because the judge said, here's the darts and maybe the employee got it closer to the bullseye, if that employer said, no, that's crazy, we're not paying you the overtime, that's, and they went to somebody else and to appeal it, right, that, and then they didn't pay that, back, that employee the back pay, the overtime, you could see how the community might be okay with that and not think that that, that employer now was an outlaw. Okay. So I'm just, again, I'm, I'm going fast with this material, but I just want to show you the way this kind of system could operate at least in principle. Okay. So last point I want to make on this, and I'll jump into a specific example just to walk through how this might play out in practice is even though this might at first sound like, you know, anarchy in the sense of pure chaos, I think actually we could describe this system as a rule of law, that there would be a rule of law in this kind of framework, at least as much as there is right now. So at, most people right now 
think that, oh yeah, if, if you say, is there the rule of law in the current United States? Most people would say yes, certainly relative to a lot of other places around the world. And yet, does that mean that if you shoot a bank teller while you're robbing a bank, what happens, and let's say, assume you're convicted, that what happens to you is the same no matter where you are in the U.S.? No, in some states there's capital punishment, in other ones there's not. Okay, so does that mean there's not the rule of law? Right, so, and you can start going through and, and seeing that what we mean by the rule of law isn't that literally the same body of rules applies to every single human being, even in a given jurisdiction. That's not, that's not what we mean. Or if it is what we mean, then there's never been the rule of law in history. Okay, so for that phrase to mean something, it's more like there's general principle. And yeah, no matter where you are in the U.S., if you just shoot a bank teller while you're robbing a bank, that's illegal. You can't do that. And certain things happen to you. The severity of the punishment might differ, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, certainly that's illegal everywhere. And then you can go, you know, down the list. But likewise, in a free society, in the kind of system that I've sketched, it is going to be the case that even if there's different law codes and so forth, like I say, if, you know, two Orthodox Jews agree, we'll have a rabbi, you know, rule on our particular dispute. And then secular people might say, oh, well, there's this, uh, this law code that goes around that's pretty popular about, you know, how certain things are handled. And there's a lot of precedent and there's lots of contractual specifications too, right? So when an employee and an employer agree to come together for a long-term job, besides the contract specifying, you know, what the pay is, how much vacation time you get, there could be standard appendices saying, you know, in the event of a dispute involving, you know, criminal matters, we agree all disputes will be handled by, you know, the, the Smith and Johnson law code as published by this reputable organization. Da, 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 da. Okay. And then, you know, there's a list of 10 reputable mediators in this area. And we agree that we will submit if we have a dispute over the contents of this contract and or the employee's conduct or the employer's conduct, blah, blah, blah we will submit to one of these 10 reputable people and you sign all that ahead of time. So even if like in general, they have very different views in terms of what you think the proper scope of law is and they have different philosophical underpinnings and so on. Nonetheless, for particular transactions, a lot of stuff, you could have contractual uh, arrangements ahead of time to remove as much of that ambiguity as possible. So it's not just like two randomly selected individuals thrown together. Okay, so that's the sense in which I think actually the rule of law, I would argue in my system that I'm sketching here would be upheld even more than in the current system. Okay, so, sorry, you can't really see this too well. Maybe you can over on that one without not as much glare. All right, so real quickly, just, it's say, okay, sure, Murphy, you, you spent a lot of time here on more run-of-the-mill, hey, disagreements happen in the course of life, employers and employees. But what about like a genuine criminal? Like some, you know, some guy, you're driving home at night and someone's walking, you know, running away from your house and they got a TV under their arm and you go in, your window's broken, your TV's gone. And you look and the person goes down the street and goes into, you know, the house down the street. You know what? And it's that kid, that, that 19 year old kid. Oh, that kid, I knew he's a troublemaker and he stole my TV. So what do you do? Well, you can go up to the, the kid's house and say, hey, I saw you running away. Give me my TV back. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. So you might think that you're personally, you know, in terms of your own moral code and ethics, if you're certain he stole your TV, you might feel justified in just marching in there and taking it. But that would be bad for your reputation, right? You, you don't want the community to think you just barged into someone's house and took that kid's TV. So instead you say, all right, in our area, there's, here's a list of 20 judges who rule on, you know, property theft. I'm willing to take our dispute to any one of them. Who, who do you want to go to? And if that, kid now that you think stole your television says, oh no, those guys are all crooks. Let's go to my, my brother-in-law. He, he's, you know, he's a good guy. He'll rule. And, and the brother-in-law, you know, has no legal training. Well, that'd be crazy, right? So if that's what happened, then the community starts thinking more that, that you're in the right. Okay. So either the kid agrees to it or not, or let's just say he, he refuses. So maybe then you just go to some reputable judge and present the facts. You know, you have the receipt from the TV. Maybe you have video footage on your driveway and see, see that someone that looks like that kid running away, whatever. You give all your evidence and maybe, so the judge renders the opinion, right? And, and again, so here, like with Judge, I don't know if you guys didn't even watch this show, but 
if she always ruled in a crazy manner or looked like she always agreed with one type of def- a plaintiff or not, the show wouldn't be popular. Right? The reason you like the show, yeah, she's tough, but she also comes off as being fair and knowing the law and blah, 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 right? So you go and present the case, and then and this is important. It's not the judge or the company that employs the judge. Then let's, let's say the judge agrees, yeah, I think it's uh, by a preponderance of the evidence that kid stole your television, that's your TV. I think you have the right to go recover that. You're still not going to go in there yourself. It could be dangerous, right? What if the kid's tough? What, what if you think you might have a gun in there or like a pit bull? And so I think there would then be a separate role for completely distinct companies that provide the service of what we might call law enforcement. So this would be the analog of what we now refer to as the police, but it wouldn't be the police. Just like right now, you don't say, oh, I went out to the restaurant. No, there's competing restaurants, okay? And this is an important point, so let me just spell this out. So right now, um, if there's a case, you know, and you see this a lot on social media, where like, you know, some, some video would be going viral either on Facebook or Twitter, that like, oh wow, the cops, you know, got some, some, some suspect in custody and just beat the heck out of the guy. And, and people are like, geez, that, that seems kind of excessive. I don't think they needed to do that, right? He already was cuffed, they didn't need to kick him in the face. And then there always will be people defending the police in the comments saying, oh, well, next time someone's breaking into your house, I guess you're just going to, you know, call your dentist, ha-ha, huh, huh. right? And so, and the reason that happens is because people think it's an all or nothing. It's the police or nothing. Whereas if you go to Denny's and get food poisoning and you put a post on social media saying, oh, I went to Denny's and got the Grand Slam and I was puking for 48 hours, I'm never going back there, people aren't going to say, oh, well, I guess the next time you're hungry, you're going to eat a rock then. You see, you see what I'm saying? Like, you wouldn't say that. You might say the person's lying, but if you thought they were telling the truth, you'd be like, okay, yeah, I can see why you wouldn't want to go to Denny's. Maybe I won't go to Denny's. But you know, it, it wouldn't just be the restaurant because there's competition. So if one screws up or does something that you think isn't good service or is out of line, you can go somewhere else. Whereas under the current system where the state provides law and order, period, take it or leave it, you know, love it or leave it kind of thing, then even if people have what could be a legitimate gripe, other people will immediately rush and dismiss that, okay? So I'm saying here, there'd be competing agencies. And so yes, if one firm acting on this legal ruling where the judge said, yeah, I do think that kid down the street stole your television set, then um, for one thing, it would be bad for business if they went in there. So what I grabbed here, by the way, I was looking, I typed in body armor, but a lot of the images, you know, the Google images were coming up with like soldiers getting it. And I was, I didn't want you to get the wrong impression. So I'm saying these companies, I don't think would be violent. It would be bad for business. If what the function of the company is, is to say, hey, if you have a valid legal ruling, an opinion from a reputable judge saying someone has your stolen property and we specialize in retrieving it, you know, for a fee, you know, maybe, maybe we get 10% of the recovered value of the property or something. That's the fee we charge. It's not good for business if they go around cracking skulls. They don't want to throw in flashbang grenades and then, oops, there was a six-month-old baby sleeping in that place that we just killed, sorry. But hey, he stole a TV, so, right? Even if they're not legally on the hook for that, they're going to go out of business. If there's some rival company that can go get your television set without accidentally killing a six-month-old who happens to be living there, okay? Whereas, again, in the current setting, for those of you who know, like that, I didn't just pick that out of the air. There's, there's examples of that where the police go in to, like they think the guy's a drug dealer or something and they, oops, and they you know, kill some little kid that was in there. And again, so some people who really don't like the police say, well, look at these monsters, these pigs. And the defenders say, well, that's the price we play, pay for you know, having law enforcement. And I'm saying if you had competing companies that provided those services, a lot of those you know, cases that are clearly off the wall would be minimized. It's not that those things would never happen, but if they did, you know, the company would have to seriously investigate to try to make sure it didn't happen again. Whereas now it's, you know, pretty cliched that the police investigated themselves and found out that uh, they cleared themselves of wrongdoing, right? That's sort of like a, a joke that a lot of people say when there's an investigation. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. And again, the, the important thing here is the people making the legal, rendering the verdicts or the opinions are not the same ones enforcing it. And likewise, the, the, the company enforcing the rules to maintain their credibility in the eyes of the public, they would, you know, if you just called them up and said, hey, 
this guy down the street stole my computer, go get it and I'll give you 10% of the you know, market value. And they say, well, what judge ruled that it's your computer? They say, well, no, it's not, but just trust me. It's, I'm telling you, that guy stole my... That company, it would not be good for business if they just did that because then they would look like a pariah organ. They would just look like a mob group that would just, you know, got paid to go steal stuff on people's behalf who paid them. Okay? So it gets hierarchical, too. You can push it and say, well, what if they, you know, and I'm, at the end of this talk, I'll get into this, too. That's, what, that's a common objection. But I'll get into that at the end to say, you know, well, gee, what if one group started acting in a violent, lawless fashion? How would they, how would they be contained? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But even here, it, it just makes the problem, you know, it's the same problem, right? I've just shown you if someone stole my TV, how could that be dealt with, at least in principle? And then, okay, so what if some company hires a bunch of guys and gives them guns and they go robbing people, what would happen, right? So it's just, it's the same problem, but just on a bigger scale. Okay, um, I think in a lot of this, I'm going to speed up here because I do want to touch on the, the military defense stuff. Uh, insurance would, would play a big role sort of like in the background. So what I just focused on here was I think like the top level framework, like the general principles of how this might unfold in a, in a free society, but, you know, based on markets, the way we're kind of used to commerce in our society, but apply to these areas where traditionally the government kind of just monopolizes the, the, the arena. So just to warm us up right now, medical malpractice and auto liability, how does that work? Just think through what that means, that those markets. So right now, if you have to get heart surgery and you go to the hospital the heart surgeon has medical malpractice insurance. So if you die on the table and then your family can prove that the doctor really did something medically wrong, it wasn't just say as a tough case and you didn't make it, but the doctor did something really incompetent and you died, you can sue the hospital, you can sue the doctor, and maybe it's a big judgment, you know, maybe it's a $3 million award, and because the doctor probably doesn't have $3 million sitting in a checking account, that's why in order to perform surgeries in the first place, the hospital is gonna insist that you need to have medical malpractice insurance, right? It might even be a state regulation, but even if it weren't, if you're operating at a big hospital, they're gonna insist that just, it's good for business, for community relations, okay? Likewise, auto liability, if you wanna drive on the roads, the government requires that you have insurance such that if you cause an accident and you owe somebody $500,000, you have insurance in place because probably you don't have $500,000 lying around to pay somebody that you kill, you know, crossing the street. Okay. So that's framework. You know, this, this is right now, this isn't science fiction. This is how the world works right now. So I'm saying that approach, I think uh, we would see analogs of that in the kind of setting that I'm talking about. So maybe that part of what happens like an employer is hiring an employee for a long-term full-time job. All that stuff I talked about earlier is specified in the appendices. And this is, but they might also say, and you also have to have proof that you're backed up by, that you're vouched for by some reputable, you know, it could be like a fraternal organization, if you're familiar with that, or we might just consider it to be an insurance policy. In case there's a judgment against you that you're, you get caught assaulting another employee on the job and then a judge rules that you owe $250,000 or if you get caught embezzling from the firm and we prove that in court and you owe us $800,000 because you've been doing it for 10 years and we just you know, figured it out, well, you might not have it. So it is a condition of working here. You have insurance that pays that you know, right away. So notice in this framework, the victims of crimes get paid immediately and then you know, the insurance companies can try to go after the, you know, the, the perpetrators if they want to. So what's interesting is there's a much broader scope for who interacts with whom in this kind of a situation. So you don't need to require that, right? Like in small towns where everyone kind of knows each other, maybe to go into the hardware store, it's not like there's going to be a bouncer at the door checking to say, hey, let me see, is your insurance policy up to date? Okay, you can answer. They might not do that. They say, hey, Frank, how you doing? And you just because it's, oh, it's Frank, it's fine. But like in a big metropolis with lots of strangers coming and going into like a mall, let's say, where they're complete strangers, maybe they would have some kind of thing at the door that, you know, you scan your phone 
in order for you to get in there, you know, who knows? We, we'll, we'll see. If, if there's an area where a lot of people feel it's an invasion of privacy, maybe that wouldn't be the market outcome. Okay, so it, it depends. Just like if you've ever been to like a, you know, a, a, a crime-ridden neighborhood and you go like into the convenience store there, certain things like uh, baby formula and maybe razors are not out on the shelves. They're like behind a glass kit, you know what I mean? So, Whereas if you're in a suburb where there's no crime, that stuff's out on the shelf. So I'm just saying, depending on the area and the pros and cons and the different competing interests, maybe you would have things like that on the front end or maybe not. But I'm just saying that's one element to kind of just ensure a systematic approach and that somebody who goes around committing crimes all the time, that's going to catch up to you. At the very least, you know, you're going to have higher premiums, just like if you get in a lot of accidents or you, you get a lot of speeding tickets you have to pay more for your car insurance than somebody who has a clean record, right? So there's going to be that element. Okay, so an interesting question. In this kind of a framework, would there be an analog of prisons? So I think there might be, but they would be sort of like a hotel. So this is what I mean. Let's say, you know, thus far we've been talking about, you know, legitimate disputes. Hey, I was working overtime. Well, no, you weren't. Or even outright theft, like someone stealing a TV. But what about like, you know, an ax murderer or some or a serial killer, what would happen in this framework? Well, for one thing, let's say the person's identified and is, you know, tried in a court, you know, maybe he doesn't show up and the, but the, there's pretty compelling evidence and the judge says, yeah, I think this guy killed, you know, at least three of those bodies that we found and, you know, maybe more. So one thing right away, every parcel of land is owned privately in this system. It, it might be like a, a group ownership, but it's not like there's public sidewalks or roads. Everything is owned by somebody, private. And so they can set whatever rules they want. And they could just say, yeah, if you're a convicted ax murderer, you can't be on our property. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, right? And if everybody in the region is saying that, you're a pariah, you're an outlaw, literally. You have nowhere to go. And so there could be these sort of oases. They might be like rehabilitation centers that religious organizations erect, you know, because they feel like, you know, the system has failed some people and they got to go somewhere. And so, or it could be just a, a for-profit center that says, hey, if you're an architect and you have anger issues and you kill people, but you're a really good architect, you can come here. You, you can't, you know, come and go. We're going to pat you down and have you wear a jumpsuit and stuff because we, you, you want you hurting our employees, but you can still work. We'll give you an, a workstation and an internet connection and you pay us, you know, $5,000 a month for your room and board and blah, blah, blah. There, there could be organizations like that. So they almost would be like competing institutions for those you know, small percentage of people that normal people don't want on their property. And we might, visiting this society, say, oh, that's kind of like a prison. But again, the, the, the inmates would have had the choice on the front end to, to go in or not. And so it'd be a sort of weird thing. So for one thing, the guards wouldn't be sadistic the way they are in the current system, because if they were, then you know, that would get known and people would just know, yeah, if, if you get convicted of a major crime and you can't walk freely on the property in your area, don't go to that place because the guards there beat you up. Go, you know, go to this place. It's, it's still like prison, but at least, you know, they're fair. <coughs> okay. So like I said, it'd be like a hotel, but sort of like the hotel California where you can't leave. Okay. Um, and then even there though, like, how would you get out? Like, what would be the analog of parole? Again, it's you have to convince some third-party organization to vouch for you. I think that would be the essential thing. That, you know, you, you flipped out and, you know, you, oh, geez, uh, my business partner really screwed me over. Like, I realized he was cheating on me in all these years. And I, I drove over to his house and we got in an argument and I picked up the, the kitchen knife and I killed him. And I, I, you know, I couldn't believe it. And that was 10 years ago. I've really, you know, amended my ways. I'm seeing a therapist and I, I promise that's never going to happen. And if you can convince some group, they might say, all right, you know, we'll vouch for you and, you know, but you have to pay really high premiums and we'll slowly let you get back into society in certain settings. You know, you're probably not going to let you work at a daycare center, but, you know, maybe you can go get your hair cut and things like that and go buy gas, right? So I'm just, so ultimately, and maybe they make mistakes, but they're on the hook. If he goes out and causes a million dollars worth of damage by killing somebody again and, you know, the judge rules you owe that, a state a million dollars for that murder, that organization that vouched for him now is out a million dollars. Whereas in the current system, if the parole board listens to the guy and says, oh, I think he's reformed, okay, yeah, sure. And he goes and kills somebody, 
I mean, they might get a, an awkward news story. You know, maybe the mayor yells at them, but they're not out a million dollars. Okay, so the incentives are just different in the current system. Okay, so in six minutes and 45 seconds, let me sketch what would the market for military defense look like. Okay, so one thing is before we jump into the, you know, the full-fledged approach of just complete private privatization, let me just do a halfway amount here. So this guy Ludwig von Mises, um, this, the, in, in the introduction they mentioned Mises University um, is something that you might want to consider attending. So the Mises Institute's named after this guy. He was a famous economist, fled Nazi Germany. Um, they didn't like him because of his classical liberal views and he was Jewish and so you know he was not a popular guy in the Nazi regime. Ended up at New York University. So he, he was not an anarchist. He was what we would call a classical liberal. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he said, capitalism is essentially a scheme for peaceful nations, but this does not mean that a nation which is forced to repel foreign aggressors must substitute government control for private enterprise. If it were to do this, it would deprive itself of the most efficient means of defense. Okay, so his point was that, you know, if you have like a capitalist country like the United States, and then you've got, you know, the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany, which are, of course, not based on pure laissez-faire capitalism. And a lot of people, especially like Americans, would have agreed as of, you know, 1935 that, yep, we want to have our agriculture under generally private markets and so on, that that's more efficient. And those, those people over in Germany with their system, and certainly in the Soviet Union, that's crazy with our systems. But, but, oh, if there's a world war, now we need the government to take everything over, to nationalize the steel industry, because after all, we got to make sure the steel goes into tanks and bombers and not to making you know, cars. That's not important. And Mises' point was that, no, if you trust private enterprise in peacetime, and that produces more food and more nylon stockings and radios and television sets, then why in wartime, when it's essential that we make more tanks and more bombers than the enemy, why would you use a system that you know is inefficient? And so he's saying even in wartime, the, the countries that relied on relative free markets did better, that you shouldn't use price controls and so just have the government buy, you know, spend money on tanks and use taxation or borrowing to raise the funds. And that, that will sort, the price system will work. So don't use price controls. No, if, if aluminum should be really expensive, let the price reflect that, and then private households will buy less of it because it's too expensive right now because that needs to get fuel, you know, sent to the war effort. So that, that was his point here, that you use, to the extent possible, market mechanisms even in wartime because that's when it's really important to be efficient and husband your resource as well. Okay, but beyond that, you know, let's push it even further. So even though Mises was still thinking the government is still in charge of buying tanks and bombers and stuff. So can we imagine, how, how could you privatize that? What would that even look like? That sounds crazy, right? Well, I think, again, as with the other uh, private law setting, I think insurance companies would play a big role here. So specifically, like, let's take a, a city like New York. And there's lots of skyscrapers, and the owners of those buildings they have fire insurance policies, right? If there's a fire that breaks out, you could stand to lose hundreds of millions of dollars. So you have insurance policies. And then given that there's an insurance company that's on the hook now, if there's a big fire, we could pay millions. Of, what are they they're gonna insist on sprinkler systems and having um, fire extinguishers placed you know, on every floor and make sure that the people working at the building are periodically trained like, hey, if there's a fire, this is the way you exit the building and, you know, have f fire drills because if they're on the hook, you know, if somebody dies from smoke inhalation or heat that, you know, they have to pay the, the claim on that. They don't want that to happen. So if there's common sense things you can do ahead of time to reduce the likelihood that this giant building gets ravaged by a fire. And they might also have contracts with local organizations that we would call fire departments. You know, maybe they're called something, you know, Jim's Fire Company or something um, in a free society, but that would be the idea, right? So likewise, same thing, but now instead of worrying about what if there's a fire, what if some foreign military comes in and seizes the building? And so the, pr the property owners are now out. Well, you could have insurance policies indemnifying you 
in that kind of a scenario. And then if that's the case, just like they'd be willing to pay to have sprinklers and fire extinguishers and stuff and smoke alarms, then they would be the ones funding, you know, some company that sets up surface to air missiles. And so that would, you know, knock out incoming enemy bombers and things like that. Okay. So I got to go faster because the time constraint, but I'm just saying that's the way I think, you know, how would you fund this kind of a system if you didn't have massive taxation to raise billions of dollars for a given region to spend on the military, I think insurance companies might fill that gap. Okay, um, real fast on, on this one. So again, with all this stuff, there's still the rule of law. So the, let me just focus on this middle one and I'll move on. Um, there's a, in wartime, if you're being invaded, it's pretty standard practice that you might cause damage to your own people's stuff. It's like an enemy's coming and you might blow up bridges and blow up the roads to slow the enemy's advance. And so you might want to do that in this kind of a framework too, but you'd have to pay for it. You don't just get to say, well, hey, there's a war on, the, the enemy's coming in, so we get, that no, you'd want market prices because maybe having that bridge in place for your own troops to go back or just to have civilians do stuff or whatever, have people get to the factories that are making the bullets you don't know, you know, that you can't play in the economy. And so what a price system does, even in wartime, where it's especially critical that you are efficient with your use of resources, is it communicates information to everybody. You know the, the relative scarcity. So maybe blowing up the bridge is a good idea, but maybe it's not. Maybe that's too important. Okay, so that's what I'm saying, that even the companies providing defense services are not above the law in this setting. And a lot of people think, oh, that ties their hands, that hampers the war effort. And I'm saying, no, it prevents your private defense forces from doing stuff that's stupid, okay? Like, for example, a lot of more military historians now think the reason that the, the Confederate states, you know, during the U.S. Civil War, if they had just used the same tactics that the colonists did against Great Britain, they probably could have lasted a lot longer, right? If they just did guerrilla warfare, where they, they wouldn't have been able to like just outright defeat the Union forces, but they probably would have stayed alive longer. So think of it this way. If you're, you got superior Union forces coming in, probably the worst thing you could do is to take all your own men, line them up and say, see those cannons? Just go march towards those cannons. That's probably the worst thing. And they said that's what they did because they thought, oh, that's how you organize a military in a modern day and that's professional and da, da, da. And we got, you know, our people trained at West Point. Okay, so I'm just saying likewise here, it's not obvious that the way to enhance your war effort is by blowing up bridges and things like that, that maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Okay, let me just jump ahead to one last thing here. I'll stop here. So for further reading on the military question specifically, I would point you to this paper. Again, if you Google my name in any of these topics, you're going to see a bunch of stuff pop up. So let me stop it at that point. I had some other slides, but I kind of ran out of time here. So let me wrap it up there and turn over your guys' questions. I think he's got it. Um, if you have a situation where it's completely private law where they agree to an arbitrator, what if one of the people just refuses to arbitrate? Like he steals your TV and then the guy just says, no, I'm not going to court and slams the door. Right. Okay, yeah, so good question. So in case people didn't hear, he just said, what if somebody just refuses to go to arbitration? Um, again, I think in the vast majority of situations, the part of the reason you'd be submitting to arbitration is so that um, you, know, you could get the judgment out of the other person, okay? And so you'd have that incentive. That's why you're going to arbitration in the first place is to settle it. So I think lots, there would be the incentive to do that. So I think it would be a signal to the community if there is some guy that's digging in his heels and saying, no, no, those guys are all crooks. You know, I was trying to get at this with the one where I said, and if he, especially if he says, no, you've listed 10 people who are all quite reputable, but you can go look at their ratings. You know, just how now there's like ratings for restaurants and things like, there would be ratings like that too for this kind of service. And if he's rejecting all that and just says, no, I would be willing to go to these people and they're all people you've never heard of. And it all turns out that they're this guy's buddies. That would just be a bad sign to the community. So I think in a situation like that, what the original person could do is go, is go to some reputable judge and the, the, the case would be tried in absentia, meaning if the other guy doesn't show up, he doesn't show up. 
And I think, you know, the community would recognize, yeah, you know, this person made every reasonable effort. This guy refused all the reasonable offers. And so then this judge still ruled against him. And so then, you know, the agency that went to get your TV, you know, could say to the community, we think we're in the right here because this is the, this is what happened. In this system, do you feel like the people might not come together and uh, simulate and start their own militias on the military defense part of it, privately funded by the people? Okay, so the question is about could there be militias? Y- y- yes. So with all this stuff, I mean, I'm just sketching what it might look like, right? So an analogy would be like, suppose, uh, you know, the Soviet Union called me over, you know, back when they were in existence and they called me over and said, yeah, we, we know that you're uh, in favor of having a free market in grocery stores. And I say, yeah, the way you guys have your current system where you plan everything, that sounds kind of crazy. I think, you know, the system with grocery stores where it's privately owned and, and they say, okay, so if we privatized, show me on a map, where would the grocery stores end up being in a free market? And I was, I, I, I don't know. That's part of the point when you, you privatize to let market forces determine that. So likewise here, I'm not saying, oh, yes, this is what society would look like on day 17 if we switch to this kind of a framework. I'm just showing, you know, sketching this is the kind of stuff I think might happen. So, yeah, I think depending on the particulars, there would be, um, you know, a role for private militias. By the way, that's I didn't have time to make my uh, comment on it, but this part, what I was saying is no standing army. I also think it would be bad for business to have swastikas, so probably no company would want to do that, but... I was saying too that, yeah, I don't think large standing armies would make business sense. Like, you know, you have a bunch of guys sitting around not doing anything most of the time. That's kind of wasteful that, yeah, I think a militia where they train on weekends or something, or, you know, maybe one weekend a month just to keep their skills in order to make sure their guns still work. That would probably be the effective. And also too, the other huge thing here is a society like this, they don't have to project force around planet earth. They just have to make it so that it's really painful if you try to take them over. Like they're more like a porcupine, not, you know, some world empire. And so again, it's it's not that they need to outclass the current Marines. It's just more that it makes it really costly. Just like Switzerland survived World War II, not because it could have defeated Nazi Germany, you know, in a head-to-head combat. It was just, they, they didn't need to, there was no reason that, to, Switzerland wasn't threatening anybody. Do you see this, like, do you see a, a world where we do shift to a privatized economy and a privatized, like where we get rid of states essentially? Like you, like what would have to happen for that to be the end result? Okay, yeah, great question. So asking, you know, is this plot, is this realistic? Is this something that we might see maybe in your guy's lifetime? Uh, I think it's more likely now than if you had asked me 10 years ago and not even for a, a good reason, like not... Not because, oh, I've evangelized and now I've convinced everyone, but I think, um, like, you guys, I don't know know how many of you saw him, but, like, Ryan McMakin came here, I know, recently to give a talk on secession. So I think a lot of places, you know, even in the United States, I think in the next 20 years, you might see some areas either literally or just sort of de facto breaking away, and you might see more systems like this. Again, not because it's formally acknowledged by the legal authorities, but just more in practice, you know, if there's an area where, yeah, the, the cops just aren't going to show up or this region right here. Yeah. We all know the military is not going to defend there. You guys would have to take care of yourself. You might see stuff like this. Uh, I'd be curious to know like what your thoughts would be on some just large organized kind of like mob or militia where basically any arbiter that voted against them, they just intimidated or paid off or yep. knocked off or just controlled a small area where it was basically just them going around robbing people. Great. Yep. Uh, Yep, that was one of my objections I ran out of time. So ejection of the private military, or sorry, the uh, mafia. So r- real quickly here, I know we're buttoning up on time. Um, before, so I think before I answer that, I just want to point out right now, look at the areas. Where is it right now that the mafia or just you know, organized crime more generally, where do they thrive? Just think it through. So it's stuff like prostitution, gambling, um, drugs, right? Uh, loan sharking, meaning like lending money with very high interest rates. So it's all areas that are either literally forbidden or highly regulated by the government. That's where the mafia thrives or organized crime thrives. And we also have an experiment in the 1920s when alcohol was illegal, 
at the, you know, at the federal, you know, had prohibition, guys like Al Capone were in that business. You know, bootleggers, organized crime was in the production and distribution of alcohol. Once they legalized it, organized crime has nothing to do with alcohol now, right? The executives at Budweiser would never say, maybe we should have a drive-by shooting and take out the guys at Heineken. Whereas people who sell cocaine, they do think like that, right? And it's not just because, you know, liquor's different in principle from cocaine, right? It's, it's the, in the reasons for that. So I think actually it's the other way around that as we privatize more and more stuff and in a sense legalize things, the scope for criminal activity w- would shrink. But even if, you know, worst case scenario, like there's some group and they, they're intimidating people and they have like a thousand guys, maybe they started out as a reputable law enforcement agency, but then over time they got sloppy and corrupt. Again, at least they're starting out, they're a small group, right? There's nine competitors that could all sort of join forces. Whereas right now, you don't solve that problem by saying, so instead of that, let's just have one group that's the, called the government and we'll give them all the guns and all the cages and let them and all the nuclear weapons and let them do everything to protect us from the chance of some group becoming corrupt, right? So you see, it's a non sequitur that you're not solving that problem. So yes, it might happen. I can't prove it wouldn't happen, but you don't solve that like by basically, you know, enshrining the, the, the bad outcome is the system that you start out with and say, oh, but we have elections every four years and that, that'll fix things. So that's what I'd say. Okay. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org. <laughs>